But there is evidence to suggest that people can find ways in which those there, there might be a, a competition for those uh, in, in terms of relationships of power or authority. So, for example, you could say, I'm part of this in-group, and all of a sudden I see immigration through the eyes of, well, this is a threat to my particular um, uh, understanding of this context. So everything that, that around me in this community, I'm going to define in a particular nationalist. So this is a particularly Irish, or this is a particularly British, or this is a particularly American uh, way of thinking. This is Here's How, Ireland's political, social and current affairs podcast, presented by William Campbell. Thank you for downloading episode 173 for the 21st of March, 2024. I've been on a low information diet. I suppose I'm someone who is generally pretty well informed, but sometimes that can get a bit too much. So a few months ago, I just tuned out, uh, deleted all of my news apps, Twitter, while it still had the bird, and all the other social media apps. And I'm not logging on to any news websites for podcasts. I'm just hitting skip on any ones that are covering current events. I suppose I'd say it was for my mental health if I was using the fashionable language of the day. I did a couple of other things too, like cycling around more often when I have short trips to make. I can report back that it works. There is certainly something about the unrelenting negativity that gets to you in a drip, drip, drip sort of way. And if the news wasn't bad enough, the hostility and negativity about the news on social media and in the comment section that almost every news outlet uses to generate more clicks and page impressions, that's even worse. I've seen it said that the online comments are so much more toxic than what almost anyone would say in real life, Not only because of the anonymity that some users take advantage of, but also because even users who don't hide their identity, they're not getting the feedback that face-to-face interaction with a human would give them in every single millennium of the existence of our species, except the current one. Even if people are using profiles that bear their name and their face, many of them are often still far more extreme in their language, far harsher in their criticism, and far quicker to assume the worst motives in their opponents. The theory is that they're disinhibited by not having anything to represent the target of their vitriol other than, at most, a name and a tiny avatar. Without that inhibition... They're willing to say things and behave in a way that they would agree is objectively terrible in any other circumstances. Well, in almost any other circumstances. There is one situation that most of us encounter where people seem to be willing to throw out the normal rules of basic respect for strangers that you meet. If you cycle regularly in any city, you'll know what I mean. Maybe the isolation of being in a sealed metal box plays the same disinhibiting role as being remote from the other humans you interact with on social media. But it seems to me that a chunk of the driving public, a large chunk of the driving public, and large enough for it not to be plausible that they're all sociopaths, that chunk of them are willing to treat other human beings with a level of hostility and disregard for their safety that any non-sociopath would consider appalling. One incident made this impression on me when I was cycling on a two-lane street in Dublin a few years back. The street had a cycle lane, if that's what you want to call it, but it was only painted on, there were no physical barriers, no wands. I was cycling at about the same speed as the motor traffic in the cycle lane when the driver beside me started to drift into the cycle lane. He wasn't indicating, there was no junction coming up, so I presume he just wasn't paying attention. I took evasive action, but the driver kept closing in on me and with maybe one or two seconds before I would have been jammed between the car and the footpath, I whacked the passenger side window to try to alert the driver to my presence. I don't remember what I yelled, but I'm sure it was something about his optician or his paternity. 
The driver buzzed down the passenger window and started to shout back at me along the lines of how dare I disrespect his vehicle. It was then that something odd happened. In the midst of a pretty heated moment, we both had a startling realisation. We knew each other. The driver was a friend of a friend who I'd bumped into at various events. I think both of our moods changed in the same instant. We were immediately both a lot more conciliatory. I told him he had to be more careful. He told me that he got a shock when he heard my hand hit his window, and we parted on good terms. The instructive part of this was that instant where we both changed from being the hostile, anonymous other to actual human beings. Once the protective shield of a metal box was removed, it was striking how fast and how much the mood changed. And I think that it's striking that that metal box does seem to perform the same function as the anonymity of social media, putting people at a remove from the humans that are the target of their anger. Not protecting those people at the sharp end, but protecting the trolls and also maybe the drivers from empathising with them. That callousness is not so easy to pull off when you're confronted with the humanity of the people whose mental health or physical safety you're endangering. So what do I take from all of this? I don't know. It's springtime. Go outside. Go for a walk. Say hello to people. As a blind boy might say, pet a dog. In a moment we'll have the interview, but first I want to say thanks to all of the patrons on Patreon, especially Kieran, who signed up as a patron since the last podcast. I really appreciate everyone who donates on Patreon. We don't get a huge amount of money out of it. It's not like we're some of the big league podcasters that you might hear of, but it pays for things like web hosting and Kevin and myself basically donate our time for free. It's also a great morale booster. When we get a new patron, we know that there are people out there who are listening and appreciating the podcast. We make big efforts to cover things that are undercovered in the Irish media. And you're more than welcome to listen for free. But if you think that you could do the same as Kieran and the other donors and throw in the price of a cup of coffee once or twice a month, there's details how to do that on the website and at the end of the show. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Here's How is Ireland's political, social and current affairs podcast. On the line, I have Dr. Matthew Creighton. He's an associate professor of sociology at the UCD School of Sociology. And uh, he's from the United States originally. His book, Hidden Hate, The Resilience of Xenophobia, published by Columbia Press recently. He also had an interview published in Nature magazine recently. The title of that interview in the magazine is Why Hidden Xenophobia is Surging into the Open. Matthew, is that a carefully phrased title for that for that interview? Yes, I think that the interest um, that it reflects is why it is that we're seeing more uh, kind of open expressions and manifestations of uh, xenophobia. Um, you could think of uh, the, 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 the riots in Dublin or the uh, arson of, of direct provision centers. Um, you could also think of electoral change that's going on in a variety of European contexts. The Dutch example is one of the more famous ones, but there's also uh, historical roots that go back to some of the debates that drove the referendum campaign in Brexit. Um, and also uh, in the United States, the kind of uh, fracturing of the Republican Party, which is a historically center-right party in, in, in the U.S., has now found itself very, very much attached to the issue of immigration. In fact, it's tied to everything from funding of the war in Gaza to support for uh, uh, continued support for, for Ukraine and domestic politics, in a sense, are defined by the, the issue of immigration. So it's very, very much out in the open. So uh, what historically had been maybe a, a lower profile issue um, is now kind of uh, from the phrasing of, of, of from the interview um, as surging into the open, which is a curiosity that I had. And one of the reasons that I, that I explored in the book. So, so is, my, is my, the, my question, my question is the, the title implies that it was always there and there is a reason why it is now in the open. So is it that you, you are making an assumption is that first of all, that it was always there and that it has not increased, but that it is becoming more open. So to analyze both of those very briefly, what's, what's your evidence of what, why do you believe that it was always there that, that the quantum has not changed? So the, the the reason that 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 it, that you that, that I uh, conclude that 
there is a, a, a change in, in what's openly expressed, but not necessarily a change in what people, the, the opinions that people held, is that uh, over many years, about a decade, um, uh, I spent time with colleagues uh, looking at uh, ways to understand how people see immigration um, that didn't require them to say things openly. And so when, when we did this, uh, what we got in a variety of contexts was a very, very different pattern of antipathy or opposition to immigration when people are offered very, very high levels of anonymity or a complete, uh, a complete anonymity, permanent anonymity, meaning that there's no point at which anyone would ever uh, be able to attach whatever they're expressing to their individual, uh, to, to them as an individual. And so what, what we find when we look at things that way, which is a way that's quite different than, let's say, a public opinion poll or a, a, a direct uh, interaction with someone saying, hey, do you, how do you feel about immigration? Or do you think you should have a closed border? Or do you think you should have citizenship of uh, people of certain characteristics, religions or backgrounds? Instead of asking that directly, when you ask it indirectly um, or with high levels of anonymity, there's remarkable stability over time. Meaning that, um, so what changes And that's research-based, I guess. Yes, that's research-based. Uh, generalizable, reproducible, population level surveys. Um, uh, and these are called survey experiments and the way we did that so that you can uh, uh, change the level of anonymity people are provided to look at the difference between what people say out in, in the open or overtly or, or what people say when they're offered high levels of anonymity. Oh, okay. It's a very natural. So, 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 so to, to clarify on that, what you are saying is that that level of xenophobia is stable when they have very high levels of, when people have very high levels of anonymity when they're asked and it is going up so I, it is more visible when there is perhaps not so much anonymity offered. That is the increase. Right. So, so what, what's changing is that there is a greater, a, a less reluctance for people to mask intolerance towards certain immigrant groups. Now, anonymously expressed opinions change as well. So the, the notable stability doesn't imply that people never, that, that there's no difference over time. It's just the most of the difference that you see in, in particular contexts, two that we were particularly interested in was pre and post Brexit and also pre and post the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. Um, so these are big, big moments in which immigration kind of came to the fore because there's a tightening labor market, a, a perception of greater competition for jobs. Hmm. And when, in the when, you, case, sorry, when you say pre and post Brexit, was that in Ireland or in the UK or? In the UK. Okay. In the UK. Um, so we're looking in, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, the pre and post Brexit, I mean, that referendum is very much tied to borders or, or borders, reclaiming borders. So, so that was a very, very big theme. Um, and so those two areas uh, were places where we could kind of look at pre and post um, uh, a change in context. And so we could look at, look at change in what happens when people express anonymity. So that would get that kind of dynamic idea that, that things are coming, surging into the open. Okay. And that then, said, then... In, sorry. Okay, and then to go to the first word in that title, why hidden xenophobia is surging into the open? Why is it happening? Um, it, it's happening. Um, it's happening for a lot of kind of more contextually specific reasons. So it's not. I don't offer a kind of a general one ex explanation in all contexts. In the Irish context, uh, Ireland it confronts, uh, um, and uh, you know, I can't claim to, to speak for Ireland or to be in any kind of unique position. But the the contextual the, the, what we have at this moment is a very tight housing market, um, and so that that relationship, that public perception of housing, it has been kind of the top one or two or three issues uh, that the Irish public uh, has confronted for the better part of a decade now. So basically, since since two thousand fourteen, two thousand fifteen, when when housing prices started to surge, and things started to, to, to change in that regard. As a result, um, uh, the uh, perception of the, what immigration touches upon in Ireland is a, um, a, a notion of competition in, for um, uh, accommodation or housing and, and resources. And so that is, a, that, that, is a, that is an issue that's not unique to Ireland, but is very, very particularly, uh, um, and is very particularly the Irish context in the sense that it's quite, uh, it's quite severe, the, the perception of, of housing. Uh, housing shortages and it's would, quite would real it be, in terms of would it, would it be true that in the mix employment opportunities are a typically much lower issue in Ireland than they would be in other countries because the economy and so forth and because of the housing crisis uh, housing is a much more prominent issue in the mix than might come up in other countries I would agree with you um, I don't have a lot of like uh, a comparative uh, survey type uh, evidence to suggest that's the case. But the Irish labor market is quite distinct um, in that there is uh, 
employment or, or unemployment rates are relatively low and the perception of the typical markers of what you refer to as labor market competition. So when people are perceiving immigrants as being a competition for work or uh, a competition for wages or having a negative effect on wages, those perceptions aren't necessarily at the foreground uh, relative to something like like housing and particularly this particular uh, interest in Ireland, which is on kind of a direct provision, which is asylum applicants and subsequent to a successful asylum applicant, you might refer to that as refugee migration. Okay. The, I know that there's various and there have been studies done and they are contentious and the applicability of the results are also contentious. There is sort of a headline that sometimes says that immigrants are a net economic benefit to a country and that's almost always true but that's perhaps on the average and I have seen other research that says although that is in the aggregate true immigration can have the effect of pushing down wages in very low skilled areas of the economy and people Irish people or or native people of, of in whatever country can suffer what you might call localized disadvantages that's to say even though the economy in the whole is doing better because you have uh, more immigrants. People who are competing with immigrants for low-skilled and low-wage jobs may well find those wages pushed down. When we're dealing with housing, I guess you could say that immigrants on the whole contribute, because they have such a huge, you know, a huge contribution to the building industry, immigrants build more houses than they live in. And uh, I've done the numbers on that, and that certainly does seem to be the case. Are you aware whether it is true or whether it's relevant that even though that you have that generalizable thing that immigrants on the whole build more houses than they live in on the whole, are there localized areas where that's not true, be it localized you know, to particular areas of the country or particular areas of the, uh, the society? So, so I, I think you make some really good points there. So uh, I, I think that, that what you're what you're pointing to is the fact that the experience of immigration and, and the subsequent perception of immigration is not shared by everyone in the same way. Um, and I, I think that's that's something that, that sometimes people who want to paint a uniformly positive or uniformly negative view of immigration sometimes overlook. The effect or the, 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 the downward uh, pressure on wages, particularly with some sectors, is very sensitive to the profile of immigration to a particular context. I, Ireland doesn't have a law doesn't have the same kind of uh, like like those study many of those studies were done in the US um, uh, it doesn't have the same profile of immigration as the US experiences which is that you have uh, a non-trivial proportion of the immigrant population in the US that is not in 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 the regular labor market so they're um, effectively outside heavily involved in trades like construction in some areas, some localized areas. And then, of course, you have a very, very high skilled uh, migration as well. So Ireland, it tends to have a, a bit more uniformity um, in, in that regard. A lot of the focus is actually on asylum seeking and um, uh, refugee style migration. Um, there's a very, very highly skilled immigrant profile as well in Ireland, um, engaged in HSC and healthcare. But a, a and also I'm not an expert necessarily in the effect of immigration on the economy. But what I do study is the effect of the perception of how immigrants are affecting the economy on how people see immigration. So uh, I would suggest that, that, that there's one additional point I would make to yours about uh, whether people really understand the objectivity of, of immigration. So like if you make the point that immigrants contribute more to the construction of housing relative to their use of housing, I'm sure you've done the numbers. I, yeah. I actually don't, don't, don't know that. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's new information to me. Um, but w- w- would that necessarily change how people see immigration? Um, possibly in, in, in some ways, but it's, uh, it's probably not the most proximate kind of more emotional reaction to immigration that, that, sure. that people are experiencing. Sure. So, but, but, so but, those arguments so, are tough to make, but those mm-hmm. arguments those don't make them any less relevant. The, another argument that's tough to make, for example, is the role of immigration in supporting the old, an aging population. So that's a very, very, very common one. Europe confronts that. Ireland not as much so, although probably in the next 30 years more so. Um, but contexts like that, older generation, which is uh, is, is using significant uh, non-native uh, uh, workers who are in nursing or, or, or geriatric care, don't necessarily have particularly positive attitudes towards immigration. Japan has a similar pattern. 
where you have older people who are very heavily using uh, immigrant labor to sustain an older age population, but it doesn't translate into a change of perception about how they see immigration. So it, the, the idea that there's, objective, there's, object, there's an objective reality and a subjective reality uh, uh, tends to be very much at play when you're talking about Sure, sure. And, and I want to deal with that objective reality and the subjective reality. And although there may be points where you know people can point to real losses that could be attributable to immigration... There, in in the round, those arguments do not tend to be made in a very rational way, and there are sweeping statements that are very easily, provably, completely untrue. And the the thought that I have on that is that if people are using arguments that are very easily rebuttable and not listening to the widely available rebuttal, then what they're doing is they are cloaking a different motivation with that apparently rational but incorrect belief and that perhaps there is an irrational or emotional reason, true reason behind their objections, behind what they're saying. What is the, the first of all, would you agree? And secondly, would you, what would you hypothesize or think is the real irrational reason behind things? behind those problems. Yeah. So, so again, like, um, uh, I, I think you're much more coherent than I am sometimes in, in, <laughs> in articulating some of these, the, these uh, contradictions, but it, it's absolutely true. Um, evidence suggests it is that the motivation behind, first off, if you have massive economic change, let's say the United States after the economic crisis and no yeah. change in the expression of, 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 of antipathy or opposition to immigration before and after, you're clearly dealing with something other than an objective reaction. Uh, to, yeah. to economic circumstances. So um, it, is, it doesn't mean that the, the, the economy doesn't matter or material needs don't matter or, or labor market doesn't matter. I don't think you're saying that or, or, or those that find it that some of that discourse to be more tied to something else. But it does mean that there's a lot of explaining to do about it. Um, and that explaining is, 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 in my opinion, is tied to is 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 tied to, to factors that are other than these material conditions. And what, what you can think of as kind of material um, uh, um, uh, determinants of yeah. why people are opposition, and so one of the one of the ways to think about this, and one of the ones that I, I strongly think is that because I mostly deal with expression, is that people are use uh, economic arguments as a, a seemingly objective way mm -hmm. to uh, justify a, a pre held. Uh, um, uh, intolerance. Yeah. Henry, Henry, oh, yeah. Henry, Henry Ford said that for every decision, there are two reasons: a good reason and a real reason. Yeah, so <laughs> what, I, I, what, what are the real reasons? Do you so, think, or do you know? Uh, so, so I, I don't. I don't have a perfect singular theory. As I said, I think that that the the determinants of of, of opposition immigration can be very contextually specific, meaning context mm. specific. Yeah. So it isn't a, a singular notion. Um, I, I, I'm going to talk a bit like an academic for a moment, just because I think it's useful in this case uh, to, to to think about it that way. And that is that when you when people are trying to to understand how they relate to other people, they often uh, lean on two things. One is how they see themselves or what group that they're part of. Um, and that might be a, a national orientation, meaning that I see myself primarily as from a particular country. Um, uh, to take it out of the Irish context, we can talk about the, 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 the UK context, the Brexit um, uh, debate if you want to. Um, um, but uh, you could think of any given context in that way. So people say primarily I'm like this, and it might be more or less salient, like you could have more or less um, meaningful in a moment. So, for example, you could say uh, uh, I, I could be interacting with you and I have I have a son and I could uh, but we're not interacting. And my role as a father is irrelevant to this conversation. So as a result, in this particular moment, there's a certain uh, version of myself. And so I'm speaking to you as someone who has an interest in immigration. And you're someone who has an interest in immigration and we're interacting on that level. Right. So um, that kind of, they refer to that as in-group identity. So it's a sense of like, this is my in-group. And an out-group, I generally like that. If I feel good about myself, I feel good by in-group. I generally like that. And, um, you know, just as I said, I was really naturalized as an Irish citizen. It's a very emotional moment for me. And I felt like I was being taken in and given part of, 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 of a society. Ireland has always been um, one of the most welcoming contexts that I've ever experienced um, in, in terms of immigration, um, certainly more than the country that I was born in. And, and, and countries like Spain that I spent many years in. Not to say those countries are uniformly intolerant, but Ireland really is kind of distinct. And so I think that's why people are kind of troubled by the most recent changes. My only point is I was brought into an in-group and all of a sudden I can see myself in that way up to a point. I can say, hey, me and you, um, uh, we're, we're part of, 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 of something. We're part of a community and that's meaningful. That doesn't mean I think other groups are bad. 
just because I like um, uh, who I'm part of doesn't mean I, I look at someone who is of a different religious background, um, uh, whether you think of the sectarian context or a different ethnic background, doesn't mean I think that they're bad. But, but there is evidence to suggest that people can find ways in which those, there, there might be a, a competition for those uh, in, in terms of relationships of power or authority. So, for example, you could say, I'm part of this in-group, and all of a sudden I see immigration through the eyes of, well, this is a threat to my particular um, uh, understanding of this context. So everything that, that around me in this community, I'm going to define in a particular national. So this is a particularly Irish, or this is a particularly British, or this is a particularly American uh, way of doing it. And as diversity, as you conf confront diversity, that could be unsettling. Yep. Um, it, can, it can be unsettling. But you don't generally say, um, uh, in a context, particularly one that has such a robust relationship with immigration, like Ireland, you don't typically then say, like, you know what I don't like about immigration is that they're of a different religion or of a different race or different ethnicity. Because with those 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 forms of intolerances are ones that we objectively know in our mind we objectively know can be are deeply problematic and we certainly golden rule applies wouldn't want to be on the other side of that. Is, sense, is there, there there's there's a discourse that happens uh, very often uh, that you will see online that essentially says X number of immigrants have come into Ireland in Y period and a. And that, that's clearly, you know, a complaint and it is typically coming from the right or the far right, perhaps. And there's often a rebuttal of that, which is to say that of that X number of immigrants that have come in, a very large Y proportion comes from Britain or continental Europe or the United States or returning Irish immigrants or people with Irish roots. And that feels like a rebuttal of that. And that's clearly a racialized discourse on both sides saying, you know, giving the number with an implication, essentially, that this is black and brown people and the rebuttal being, hang on a second, those, you know, the, like, don't, like, don't worry, yeah. don't worry about yeah, that. Don't worry, like, they're all white, which is a strange yeah. argument to come from the left, although it is perhaps justified in the sense that those figures are very often presented in a context and sometimes explicitly saying that th these are foreign Muslims or in, in some other perhaps slight euphemism for that, you know, incompatible with our culture or whatever. So, you know, it is perhaps fair game to rebut that, but there's just no questioning the fact that on both sides of that argument, and I don't want to make them equivalent, but both sides of that argument are pushing the otherness or the non-otherness of immigrants. That is, I mean, that's the case, isn't it? Absolutely. And I, I think that, well, first off, um, uh, I, I think that's that, that's a very kind of interesting point to make. I think a lot of people would overlook that debate and not not find that that kind of glaring but but very true statement that um, seeking to de-emphasize a concern about immigration by pointing to the racial homogeneity of of the of the immigrant uh, community that 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 is entering is not really. It's kind of like two sides of a very similar coin in in some ways. So I, I think that's right. A lot of my work doesn't make anyone happy, I'm going to be honest, because if you think about masked uh, uh, immigrant, uh, anti-immigrant sediment, a lot of what I'm saying is, on the one hand, you're legitimizing the experience of immigrants who, uh, who experience discrimination in the labor market. Um, in fact, we, 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 there, there's strong evidence from correspondence studies to show to the extent of that. Um, yeah. But um, on the other hand, you're also saying, like, you know, if you feel like there's a lot of other people that aren't saying it, but do agree that immigration is problematic, they are there. You know, yeah. the difference between what people say. So in the sense, you don't, you don't make either side happy. So I'm very familiar to the position you've put yourself in, which is to say that those generally who think of themselves on two sides of the debate are kind of hitting on, on, one, on one thing. And that's exactly right, is that they are both, they're legitimizing the concern that there are specific differences without saying them. There are specific differences about immigration that are um, acceptably problematic, but they're not being very explicit about that. And this is the key of this kind of using anonymity to, to get at this is because um, you can say, well, listen, most people from the UK and the US, um, uh, and it was, I think, in, in when, I, when I naturalized, the largest single group were kind of post-Brexit long-term residents from the UK. Right we now, sh we should say it. before we started recording, you talked about your recent uh, naturalization ceremony. So you're saying that the, the bulk of the people who were at your ceremony were Brits and well, Americans. There, there was people from all over. I mean, it was, yeah. it was absolutely beautiful expression of... of, of of Ireland's um, uh, ability to, to to kind of bring into the fold uh, people from all kinds of different backgrounds in a, in a very poignant ceremony. 
But yes, I, I don't think it was the, the majority of the people there, but it was the largest single group who were nationalizing were, 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 were from England or from, from the UK more broadly. Okay. And I guess the US were well represented there as well. Um, uh, no, no, I don't know if they make the people, do they make the, the I'm not sure if the people who do the uh, naturalization by association do come to Ireland for, for an in-person ceremony, but I believe they'd have to. So that does make sense. Uh, um, yes. Um, the other issue on that, and there's a cartoon that regularly does the rounds, which I think is meant to be a caricature and not very kind one of Rupert Murdoch, who I think is aged about 150 at this stage. And he is almost invisible behind a pile of cookies saying to a white, obviously indigenous European worker who has one cookie on his plate saying, pointing to a brown or black person saying, mind that immigrant, he wants to take your cookie. Um, to what degree and that's obviously a very left-wing critique, basically saying that hysteria about immigration is essentially being used by the ultra-wealthy to distract people from protesting against them and to dire redirect anger towards, basically, that would otherwise be directed at the ultra-wealthy. Um, to what degree is that reasonably true do you think that there's a an organized or even disorganized effort on the part of very wealthy people to essentially redirect anger towards immigration that might otherwise go towards themselves and the reason i'm asking is because on the right the discourse is very very much saying that the elites are all in favor of immigration and are you know depending on how racialized that that discourse is is you know kind of to dilute our culture or in some other way to um weaken the society or whatever they feel is important do you do you give any credence to that i don't um i, I just because I, I don't think that the elites are as coordinated as that suggests <laughs> but the uh, uh i i do think that they, they wouldn't that, get that, that rich elites... if they weren't at least a bit coordinated true i'm not dismissing the point you're making i'm just going to suggest a slightly different uh rather than a more kind of singular organized um somewhat conspiratorial understanding of it i would suggest that there that 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 concentrations of wealth or high levels of inequality in a society can make immigration a more salient issue in other words, so that people who are uh, in context of in, in, high levels of inequality create a lot of status and security, a lot of status and security that goes into it. And that's meaningful insecurity. The only reason I uh, it, 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 and so as a result, people can be more uh, activated by the idea that there's a competition for anything. So the, uh, you know, the perceptions of jumping the queue or the perceptions of difference can be exaggerated when um, there is a scarcity uh, of access. And that's not necessarily just economic access. That's access to a variety of things. So if you think of elite as being capturing a political context and so you're getting a kind of reproduction of a, of a political elite, um, you get uh, it, it's not an accident that 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 those that find immigration to be problematic also gravitate towards kind of insurgent, more populist types of political dynamics because mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't it, it suggests a, a kind of anti-establishment approach. There are a lot of anti-establishment um, style political parties also in the margins, mostly on the left, I would say, that also find uh, the issue of anti-immigrant sentiment to not be a useful uh, political, um, uh, you know, a, a political issue to push. So you can be focused on structural inequality, you can be opposed to, to concentrations of wealth and not find immigration to be a useful way to do that. Um, but I, you, you do find both. Um, and the only reason I hesitate to go too far into saying that it really comes from above is that it does take away too much agency, I would say, from a, 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 meaningful, a, a, a meaningful conversation that has to have with a significant proportion of the population is finding that anti-immigrant sentiment is more something that they can more openly express um, than th that they did before. And that that isn't something that you that isn't necessarily something that, that I would say is so directed. It's, it's a much more uh, organic and, and situational uh, thing. Um, so as a result, I, I do hesitate to go too far into kind of this coordinated, but I, I do hear your point. Um, and I, I think that, that you that that's right. Um, I just think of it more as in context with high concentrations of, uh, of wealth in particular among uh, a very, very small group of people or high levels of inequality is another way to say it. So the difference between those are the least and those are the most is, is very, very large. It can create uh, uh, the, the conditions of which this kind of in-group and out-group dynamic that I talked about and also some of the material conditions are much more uh, uh, in, in, in foregrounded. Okay. To, to perhaps counter your point slightly obliquely, you say that the elites are maybe not that well coordinated. But for example, Eric Schlosser, in his book, Reefer Madness, he writes about the agricultural workers in California in particular, 
and how farming lobby, which is very powerful, particularly in California state government, how they managed to make illegal immigration a very precise level of illegal, with the result that it was possible for people from Central and South America to come and to work for very low wages in agricultural jobs, literally picking the fruit and vegetables, but not so legal that they could get rights. And he is very clear that his his conclusion is that this is a deliberate policy, that they want to make immigration just possible enough for people to come so that they have cheap labor, but not so easy that they could then organize, demand minimum wages, demand education for their children, healthcare, and so forth. That does seem to be relatively well organized. Would you think that at least locally, you know, in, in localized situations, that there's exploitation, quite calculated exploitation of the immigration issue by people who just have a financial interest? Yeah, I would say that that the uh, that particularly the U.S. context, like we mentioned before, has a has a, a profile of immigration that has a non-trivial proportion who are outside of any sort of registration system in the U.S. And as a result, um, that, that is that's very difficult economic situation, a very vulnerable economic situation to be yeah. in. And, and the history it's calculated of, so the agri- it, it calculated as well. I, as I said, I, I don't know specifically this, so I can't. Sure. No, I'm not asking you to, to be an to, expert to... in Southern California. I understand uh, immigration. So, so, but, but uh, um, there, there was a long tradition. It was called the Bracero Program, which was a long um, a labor migration uh, relationship with Mexico that ended in 1964. Um, the, the guest worker program in the Netherlands and Germany ended in 1974, which is a similar, yeah. uh, a European similar program. So those, the, the Bracero Program, those networks run deep, um, and so there was a, a continued network based um, uh, relationship of labor. Um, and like Cesar Chavez and a lot of the the, the, the activists that uh, sought greater rights for for itinerant and seasonal workers in in agriculture, yeah, I would say that that my understanding of that is that in that case uh, there was an effort to use what academics refer to as a bifurcated labor market. So the idea that that that, that it's kind of a two tiered labor market and the labor market depends on cheap and persistent. Uh, importation of labor uh, to remain uh, maximally profitable is the idea of, of the bifurcated labor market. Okay. Now, and I don't. You said another the, another the example. Idea. Just growing up in the south. Yeah. Just before I leave it. Just growing up in this. In, I grew up in the south in the U.S. The idea that there are businesses in the U.S. Um, that are very keen to prevent uh, the or, uh, organized labor from taking hold is not unique to the undocumented migrant experience in the mm-hmm. U.S. So the uh, large uh, auto manufacturers has consistently moved to states like Alabama and Georgia as well to avoid any sort of organization um, of it. And chicken processing as well, relative to New York, down to, to has also exploited not always immigrant labor, but also non-immigrant labor to avoid uh, organization and unionization. So that isn't that I'm not saying that the example you gave isn't a good example of someone having a con- con- coordinated effort to take advantage of an immigrant uh, immigrant labor system. But the idea that there would be an interest among U.S. large businesses to prevent the organization of workers is would not necessarily be unique to agriculture in Southern California. Okay, it should be mentioned, perhaps, and you mentioned the guest worker program, particularly in Germany in the the boom years after the post-war recovery, the Turkish workers who were brought in were required to live on site in the, literally in the Volkswagen and Audi auto plants in essentially dormitories, were not allowed to bring wives and children. And crucially, the visas were 11 months long. So they were essentially being sent back for one month every year and the and pr- also prevented from learning German. And the stated aim of this was to prevent them from establishing any roots at all in Germany. And also by that token are rather more exploitable. But the one thing I want to go on to, and I want to just go to a sli- uh, short clip from a protest in Dublin last year. I'm going to get you to listen to this. We're only seeing the, the sofas of it now in Ireland. It's called the Carriage Plan. Look up the Carriage Plan. We're all going to be overrun. You know, they were like, they're going to take over the country. That's the plan. The plan is being set 20 years ago. You want to annihilate the white people. So what they're doing is, they're sending Muslims and every other colour into these white indigenous countries to delude the white people so the Jews can take over, but they're using the Muslims to attack us on the street right now. The Muslims are going to turn their face from what's actually coming at us is the Jews and the Muslims. But they're going to fight for them and they're going to attack us on the street. They've sent them here on purpose. What the plan is, they're going to, they want to dilute the white race 
So the Jewish race and the Iraqi race will be the supreme race. They're afraid of us. They think we have no. I don't think any white race is any more be better than any other race. This is their opinion, not ears. I'm telling you what the Kennedy plan is. It's their own opinion. They're coming here, they're going to dilute us all down. There's no white people left in any country, not just Ireland, any country. It's happening everywhere. Any indigenous white country, they're flooding with loads of men to, to have in the course with their girls, and there'll never be another white child born. We're probably the last of the white Irish. And that's a fairly uh, uh, stark example of a type of ideology that's being pushed. And the origin of that idea, I don't know if that person who was speaking has any idea of it, but the origin of that idea is a French writer called Renaud Camus, and uh, he published a book in, I think, 2011, which essentially said what that uh, person was saying. It's a fairly well-worn anti-Semitic trope that essentially saying that there's only about 20 million Jews in the entire world. So saying that the Jews are going to take over the whole world by force isn't credible. So they add in this thing of saying that uh, the Jews are the ones who are causing immigration. And this is adapted from a previous conspiracy theory that was more popular in the United States, which was that the Jews were going to use the blacks in order to take over America. And that was used as arguments against uh, racial integration and equality in the 50s and 60s in the United States. But one obscure for Ireland conspiracy theory from the US, then adapted by a very obscure and not very notable French writer. How does it end up that you have somebody with a megaphone on a street corner shouting out those ideas, which clearly come from that origin? And, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's thousands of crackpot writers writing thousands of crackpot ideas around the world. But this one has been repeated as well as on Dublin Street Corners by people like Tucker Carlson on Fox News. Why is that gaining traction? So that's a painful clip to listen yeah, to. Yeah, it is. In, in my opinion. That's a painful clip to listen to. Um, so it's, it's, it's some of the most extreme versions of, of uh, animosity towards, um, uh, based on race um, and a kind of conflation with, with religion and the mixture of religion with race. And so I agree, it's an old trope. It's effectively... I think we can refer to it now as just replacement theory. So this was this. this sure, yeah, there. yeah. And if you and, Google um, that, you'll get a thousand uh, websites saying. It. But 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 that version and of Charlottesville, it, like Charlottesville in the U.S., similarly. Uh, yes. People, so uh, so the, right, the people chanting, in Charlottesville. We will not replace us. No, and and then merging that into Jews will not replace us. So that is referring to this that Jews, for some reason, intend to replace white people with, if you're in the US, with black people. If you're in Europe, then that is obviously not credible. So it's adapted to North African Muslims. But there are a thousand crackpot conspiracy theories out there, everything from birds aren't real to the earth is flat. But that so one so why is the one... Why one catch on is the idea. Why, yes, why exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's, that yeah. is my question. Yeah. I don't have a perfect answer for that. I wish I did. Um, but I would say that you're absolutely right. It is. You see it more uh, and more... Um, I, I would suggest it's a blend of two things. One is that there uh, is a, uh, a greater ability uh, in public space for people to express relatively more extreme views. And I would suggest that comes from two, two domains. One is that people, uh, there are a lot more outlets than there pause, were pa 20. Pa pa pause on that for a second, Matthew. You're right. There's a lot more, everything from Twitter to Fox News, there's an awful lot more outlets for people to express crackpot ideas, but that doesn't explain why that crackpot idea in particular is the one that has gained traction. Right. So, so I'm just saying that there, there's a lot more avenues by which you can put out these. So why did that one catch catch hold as opposed to, you know, maybe people being able to confront it in a more, you know, in, in a singular terrain and yeah. say like, okay, here's the idea. The other one is the, that, and I, as I said, I don't have a, have, a, have a perfect answer for this, is that I, I found in the Brexit debate, uh, if you look at um, uh, the rise of, uh, of Wilders in, in the Netherlands is there's a greater legitimization among those that are seeking political opportunity by garnering this type of, uh, of support. So in other words, there's a scene that there's an actual interest um, um, uh, in, in, within democratic structures, within legitimate democratic structures to find those that express that opinion to be a useful constituency. Um, and that was not always the case. I would say in the U.S., the uh, there are sectors of the Republican Party, which is a mainstream party, that express a sentiment that 
would never have been viable before, but is now when you have a, a very close elections or in the case of the Netherlands where you have, uh, you know, if you get 27% of the vote, I think that's what, what, what Builders got in, in, in 2023. Um, uh, when you, that's all you need to all of a sudden become the dominant party within. So you're looking at these razor margins. And so groups like that become uh, uh, important. And so this is what, this is what I, I, I suggested often happens. Um, and this is in the book as well is, is uh, 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 political elites um, in general can use a, a form of dog whistling in the sense that they can signal very, very high um, support for uh, those, for, for the broad issue of restriction on immigration or immigration being the problem or those of a different race or ethnicity without being necessarily explicit about it. Mm-hmm. So long as they can go up to the point that, that now I don't want to give too much credibility to her in particular. She's yep. pro- I don't know whether she's the voice of anyone more than three people standing next to her or not. But I hear what you're saying in terms of replacement theory is there as a meaningful so if you have that view you're not going to necessarily find a a, a politician who's going to say like yeah right on that's what's happening yeah that's what's happening but you will find a politician that you can say like listen that's our guy yeah that they're not saying it but that's our guy um and so uh one thing to think about that is there's a lot of contexts that have have just capitulated to that and so you have people who are very clearly identifiable with that um uh ireland's not in that position right now so Ireland doesn't have a, a party. It's got it's got the spectrum of a lot of other political um, uh, um, identities that are out there. It's got strong nationalist parties. It's got strong. It's got center right parties. It's got center left parties. It's got uh, you know it's got a bit of, a far left parties. But it doesn't necessarily have a single party that captures that sentiment. So the point I make about if you want to compare the Netherlands to Ireland is in, in the Netherlands what you had is is ideas like that really come to the foreground and people able to act on that. And so they gained traction because they were legitimized, yep. in my opinion. They were legitimized uh, and, and were, there was people who were actually with an interest in that becoming a constituency. In Ireland, you don't necessarily have that case. So she may have an interest in it, but I don't necessarily at this point, unless there decides to be a, a, an exploitation of those views in some sort of organizational way, like we're going to bring that in as a constituency, I wouldn't necessarily think that she's reflective of it. But you know more than me in that regard. I don't necessarily know the, the darker sides of the internet uh, the can can, can I, I, I? I'm not sure that I do. But can I suggest that one particular reason for that, and I think people in Sinn Féin will not like the way that I express this, and I take that on board. But in Ireland, Ireland's fascist party is a left wing fascist party, is Sinn Féin. And I don't want to be overly critical of Sinn Féin, so I want to qualify that, which is that if you look at the demographic that particularly the Front National in France had, but also the AfD in Germany has, and so forth. You get a mixture of disaffected working class, strongly male, strongly economically disadvantaged, and a sort of an elite at the top of the party that is actually quite academic and quite well-educated, albeit with very strange ideas outside the political culture. And that demographic is strikingly similar to what Sinn Féin had up to recently. They have broadened that considerably. But Sinn Féin, and this I hopefully will soothe the feelings of any Sinn Féiners that I have offended, Sinn Féin have, to their credit, given very good leadership to that demographic and pointed that essentially in a left-wing direction. And it would be certainly very taboo within Sinn Féin to promote victimising immigrants. They perhaps locally have the Brits to be a punch bag for all of Ireland's problems for people who might not be thinking of it that rationally. But it has been hypothesised that if we were to have a Sinn Féin government for the next five years, for example, that might make Sinn Féin not as perfect a receptacle for just generalised anti-authority, anti-government feeling and could open a space for far-right parties. Do you think that the fact that Sinn Féin has existed for there has been growing for the past 20 years at least. It has perhaps people voting for it for economic reasons because they're on the left. It has people voting for it for nationalist reasons because they want to see United Ireland. But it perhaps also has people who are not as bought into those ideas voting for it because it seems like a muscular anti-authority, anti-government party. And if they become the government, they are not such a good receptacle for that. And do you think it's possible at that point that some of these small change uh, parties might break free from the pack and become electorally viable? So, so again, I'm just going to ask you one question because you seem sure. smarter than me on this particular issue, um, which, which I, I don't get to talk to people like you all the time. So I want to ask you a question. 
Do you think that uh, that 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 Sinn Fein's historical uh, relationship to the Irish diaspora is meaningful in the way that they perceive immigration in currently? In one direction only, uh, okay. Sinn Fein perhaps has a fairly significant um, ideological buy-in to the fact that very high, traditionally very high rates of emigration were the result of British colonialism and perhaps as they would see it, an inadequately nationalist government in the South. I think that Irish nationalism based in the United States, if they knew anything about Sinn Féin policies, would have no truck with it whatsoever. Okay. Okay. The the other thing that I, I would add to, to the description you gave of Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin has also taken quite a leadership role in the issue of housing in particular, yep. which is very intimate, intimately related to uh, immigration. So uh, I, I, I'm a sociologist, um, so I'm not going to necessarily claim expertise always in, in predicting political change. But I do see an opportunity within a party like Sinn Féin to be confronted with the following choice, is that if you, as you say, that those are the kind of anti-establishment constituency once you're in, once you're governing, might find that party to be less uh, of an outlet for that, for that. And so Sinn Féin will be confronted where we can either watch a, another party grow as a result. So it can be a receptacle for that constituency, or we can, uh, uh, in, we can change our rhetoric to continue to capture that vote. And so you could either see, you, you could either see an agenda shift within, within a party in Sinn Féin's position, which is to maintain that constituency. And to is, that, is, that a polite, anti- is that a polite way of saying that you think they might start making populist anti-immigrant noises? Um, if it's oh, seen as electro- electorally expedient, there would be examples of other parties confront with similar choices who went that route. Mm-hmm. So the, Republic, the Republican Party in the U.S. would be an example of that route, um, where rather than see uh, Tancredo or a few of the kind of more extremist candidates that went out there or uh, uh, they, they, they went with it, um, in more of a multi-party system, you might not see that. So that's very that's that's a, the U.S. political system is barely democratic in the sense that if you're a third party, good luck with that. Yeah. So it's it's more it's more of machinations within it. So in a context of a multi-party system like Ireland, I do think that I mean you see people for profit, you see parties that are very consistently polling below three percent and never go away. So they don't disappear. They're perfectly capable in that way, and they have opinions that are well outside the mainstream, proudly so. So that party could be you could see that 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 going. It okay. goes in that direction. Uh, uh, I so don't you, know. You I don't know enough about it, but I do know. I do know that some that some would look at the context of Italy to yeah. to say how how the, some of these a multi party system, the five star movement took over. The five star movement was an anti establishment par- party that pretty ambivalent relationships with immigration. Then started to really kind of hang out with with Liga Nord, and uh, you started to get uh, coalition governments and relationships that you just did not anticipate, and really pivoted in many ways um, uh, in, in that way. So. I think there are perhaps some comparisons that would suggest that that what you're saying is true is that you uh, that, well what I'm suggesting is true is that Sinn Féin may actually pivot and take on some of those issues themselves given the opportunity rather than become a oppositional party again and no longer being able to govern if they can't hold the coalition. Okay, from my knowledge of the individuals involved, I think that's improbable. I think that a, and I don't know that it would happen, but I think it would be more likely that a far right party perhaps could gain traction because Sinn Fein might lose that generalized anti establishment non very uh, not particularly uh, so, so, uh, ideological so, so um, let me support. ask you again because because I'm really enjoying talking to you about this so the um <laughs> if if um if if that happens let's yep. say because I, I I trust you to, to know much more about because it very much is, is is what elites in the party decide to do in terms of strategy so so it's very much determined by that um what do you think the success would be of a small party like that? Because other small parties in Ireland do seem to be stuck in the three to four percent range and don't really pull their way out of it. Um, so I, I think small parties. Um, this is going through a theory of Irish politics that is outside the scope of this particular podcast. And I think that small parties fall into two categories, and one of them is a category that any success that it has has a relatively short cycle a, a couple of elections and there's been a whole uh, string of parties and the defining thing that uh, for perhaps the Green Party and people before profit and so forth is an extremely coherent ideology and that's the only thing that can allow a party that is that small to continue 
through decades is an extremely coherent ideology, even if it is only held by a small number of people. And I'm impressed by the way that you're uh, questioning me as I, I thought I was meant to be the interviewer, but that's, <laughs> that's, that, I think the listeners will be impressed by that as well. So I won't object. But I just want to finish up on one thing here. There was a hoax published a hoax article which managed to get published on the Irish Times website last year, which essentially was written or was presented as having been written by a female Latino immigrant from, I think, Ecuador to Ireland. And the article was extremely cleverly written to hoax the Irish Times. And I think in particular, one reason why it managed to actually get published by the Irish Times and bypass their, you know, what I would have thought were their, their um, you would imagine, minimal good verification. Security. Yes, yeah, their verification would be, was because it positioned the immigrant in a position as essentially a victim of working class Irish people. And that appealed to the middle class sensibilities of the Irish Times. They liked, the readers of the Irish Times liked to feel like they weren't anti-immigrant. And it was a complaint that Irish people buying fake tan in pennies, which is a real dog whistle of a working class shop. Those Irish people who bought fake tan in pennies were racist and were in some way culturally appropriating being brown. People who take expensive foreign holidays and fly to other places in the world, like the Irish Times readers, were not accused of this. And I think that very, very cleverly betrayed a hypocrisy, you know, in the culture that these people on the far right might be very critical of, in that the narrative of the far right is that these elites want immigration and want to use immigration against ordinary working class people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that, t- you know, that type so, of that type of idea uh, is, is, is nonsense for all sorts of reasons. But those type of ideas don't gain traction if they have no grain of truth at all in them. So the, the you know, the birds aren't real type conspiracy theories don't go anywhere because they don't have any grain of truth in them. There is something there about left-wing academics and the internationalized type third culture people who are much more comfortable with people of their culture and their class from other countries than they are across class with, for example, working class people in their own country. That is true, isn't it? I'll give you an interesting example. Um, I, I'm, I apologize if it doesn't directly speak to your point, but I think sure. it does. In that I don't necessarily, I didn't, when I, when, I, when we were doing field work in Ireland, we didn't look specifically at class based on occupation, which is what you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're specifically looking at. But we did look at, at, at differences based on levels of education. And so the, one interesting phenomena, um, and this was published in a report with the ESRI as well as um, uh, a, a, a paper that came as well, is that those that are the most educated are also the most likely to mask their intolerances. So like if you are, uh, if you have a college education or if you have a college university, um, um, basically upper secondary above, you are, the difference between what people say in terms of a question, for example, do you support Muslim migrants um, to, to come to reside in Ireland? The difference between what you say openly and what you say under conditions of anonymity is about 26 percentage points. Okay. And the difference for those that have primary school education or lower secondary, um, so, so some of the least educated, um, is about between 6 and 12. Okay, so, so so that that we mentioned at the start, that differential between the let's say true or high anonymity answers is much greater as you go up the education scale, and uh, people are yeah, perhaps- specifically for the most educated, and and it's, it is particularly the case of Ireland. But the point you're making in terms of there's kind of a sense of this isn't this isn't a concern among those of, of our particular uh, a social class. This is something that we can much more likely pin on. Um, uh, a, a group uh, that is of, low, of lower socioeconomic status yeah. is something that um, uh, I don't think that you're I, I, just because people aren't saying it as much as you're chattering around and, 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 and having a, a, a cocktail party or, as you say, you know, sharing a, a holiday together isn't necessarily mean that, that those sentiments aren't held. It just means that people are much more strategic about what, the, the way they use them. Um, so uh, so I, I would suggest that you're right. Once again, you're making no one happy, as you did before. Is that mm. your, your suggestion? It, it, perhaps, that yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if anybody will get to the end of this podcast. They'll, we'll have offended everybody. But deal with the point specifically that okay, sorry. there is a hypocrisy amongst the people who are 
perhaps caricatured as Irish Times readers are the elite in RTE who want to be very, very careful to make sure that there's, you know, on the uh, Late Late Toy Show, make sure that there's prominently positioned immigrant kids, you know, people who are visibly um, not white so that they're visibly, you know, making a special place for immigrant kids in the audience there or in a, a whole load of other situations. And for example, we've seen how Google's AI recently went crazy and is essentially creating images insisting on having what is called diversity, that's to say no white people, in all sorts of ludicrous situations such as the founding fathers of the US and so forth, uh, being represented as being black and Native American and so forth. That's clearly insane. But that is coming from a perhaps better disguised hypocrisy on amongst would, more educated, more right. elite people. And I think you're absolutely right. So the, the stigmatization, think about it this way, is like when you go through a process like a higher education and the selection into higher education, um, you are navigating very complex rules of a society. Yeah. This is called the hidden curriculum. And it's a well-known phenomenon in education is that what you get in, in, in many aspects from, from higher education and being an elite secondary schools is you get a greater understanding of the social norms that govern um, a, a society as much as you get uh, very, very good skills in mathematics and science. Yeah. And, and those so, social norms allow demonization of working class people in a way that they do not allow demonization of immigrants. Exactly, exactly. Um, um, uh, because that's what that social mobility is afforded. How do you know you're socially mobile? Is because you're not like them. So the uh, so you you know that that is a, a success and maybe an even overcompensation for those. Depending, I mean, there's some evidence to suggest that people who are more intergenerationally mobile, so those that achieve much greater education than the parents before them, can be even more likely to denigrate um, uh, 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 people of a certain social class because that, that it's a sense of, of creating an even brighter line and distinction. So I would say you're absolutely right. The mechanism, as a sociologist would say, it is that it's stigmatization. So I think a lot of people would refer to that as political correctness, but it's stigmatization, meaning that they are much clearer in their understanding of the costs, social costs, to expressing intolerance, even though they might have those intolerances in other, in, in other, in other areas. I should stop. Dr. Matthew Creighton, Associate Professor of Sociology at UCD, also author of Hidden Hate, The Resilience of Xenophobia, published by Columbia Press recently. Thank you very much for talking to me. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate your time and also that you answered my questions. Go to the website for sources and references from the show. And while you're there, you can like the show on Facebook and follow the show on Twitter at Here's How Podcast. I promise I'll have a look at it sometime. And get in touch if you want to suggest a guest or a topic for a future show. The email still works, podcast at hereshow.ie. Thanks again to all of the patrons on Patreon, especially Kieran. It covers the costs of keeping the podcast going. And if you could throw in a couple of euro once or twice a month, please do go and sign up at patreon.com slash hereshow. That link is on the website. Also there you can find out how to subscribe to the podcast for free on your computer, on your phone, or by email. All that information is at www.hereshow.ie. The Here's How podcast is produced and presented by me, William Campbell. The co-producer is Kevin Wolf. Thank you for listening. Thank you.